eternal rock of ages, we love you. We thank you. We cannot thank you enough for your grace, for your goodness, and your mercy. Lord, thank you for the men. This generation does not want men at all. This generation has told the lie that you can achieve without a man. But thank God for godly men who have chosen to stand. Thank God for godly men who says against all the odds, uh, we will do that which God has called us to do. So Lord, thank you for this weekend. Thank you for a time of refreshment. And Lord, as this feeble human bring your word to your people, I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring revelation. And our lives will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we spoke, and I will speak on it again as the Holy Spirit leads, on God's man for this generation. God's man for this generation, or you can change it to God's man for his generation. And we will read, I would like to read what a man that God used in his generation, what he taught about his role in God's army. And that person is uh, King David, wrote the book of Psalm, wrote majority of the early Psalms, and then uh, so, some other people wrote uh, uh, other Psalms, but he wrote this one, Psalm 101. Uh, David said, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who walks deceit shall not dwell in my house. He who tell lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. David wrote that to say, this is what I believe the Lord wants from me, not just as a man, but as the king in the land, as the second king of Israel, of joint Israel. God's man for his generation or for this generation. There's one thing we need to know about God. The God we serve, I'm going to make a statement and some of you will say, really? Yeah, because I know that there's a lot of book about the name of God. God actually does not have a name. What we call his name today are attributes. I hope somebody understands what I mean by that. The closest God came to telling us his name is when he told Moses to tell Pharaoh, tell him, I am that I am. Not a yamo. <laughs> I am that I am. What we call his name today are really attributes. You know, um, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. These are things that is who he is, his attributes. And, uh, but God does not change. God is Alpha, he is Omega. Basically, those are Latin alphabets. He is the beginning and he is the end. He exists before time and he's going to exist in eternity. That's God. Uh, I will encourage you to do a study of God, whether it's Trinity or who God is or even his attributes, so many attributes that he has. God, in his infinite mercies, decided to create us human beings. By the way, we exist before conception. 
human being, we exist on a continuum. Jeremiah 1.5, God told Jeremiah, uh, he said, you know, Jeremiah was already ministering to the people and God said, now I'm, you are going to minister to the leaders. And Jeremiah was complaining and God said to him, before you were, con not born, no, formed, formed, conceived, I knew you. Not only did I know you, I already have a plan for you. You're going to be the priest to about five kings, crazy ones who won't listen. The Bible says you should check one doctrine with another. That same concept is in uh, Isaiah. It's in Judges 13. It's in Luke chapter 1. The concept that before you were conceived, God knew you and he already has a plan for you. So it's not just confined to Jeremiah. It's all over. Now, so that's one thing. Then God, as I have studied scripture, God created us human beings and sent us on earth for a purpose. There are reasons. He didn't just send us here. Uh, he sent us for his pleasure, but to do certain things while we're here on earth. As I've studied it, I've come to the conclusion that he created us to worship him. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. In Romans 12, Paul was writing about the cross in Romans 11, and he says, because of God's mercies, make yourselves a living sacrifice so that you will know God's perfect will and do it and that is your reasonable act of worship. In some translation it says service. Uh, I prefer the translation that says worship. Because we know that worship is not when you sing and dance. Worship is when you use what God has given you. Use it for him. So when you use your intellect to honor God, you are worshiping. When you give resources to God, you are worshiping when you raise your children in god's way you are worshiping somebody understand that concept and our worship brings glory to god john 15 8 jesus if you read actually verses 1 to 8 jesus said i am the branch you are the branches my father is the gardener and uh, your job as a branch is not to bear fruit Many of us think our job as branches to bear fruit. No. Go read John 15 verses 4 and 5. Your job is to abide. Not fruit. Abide. When you abide, God will bear fruit through you. Jesus said a branch cannot bear fruit except it abides. And then in verse 8, Jesus said... Your fruit will bring glory to your heavenly Father. Nobody eats his own fruit. If you see a branch eats his own fruit, you will call your favorite television station to come out and see it. Our fruit is for others so that our heavenly Father is glorified. Those are the two things that we're here for. And each one of us will have general purpose, things that everybody will do, like parenting, like marriage, which God will glorify himself in. But we all also have specific purposes. Each person has specific purposes. If I start to mention him, you will start to understand what I'm saying. Moses, before he was born, the Bible says Israelites prayed for a deliverer and God sent them a baby <laughs> in Moses. Moses was born specifically to deliver Israel. Samson. Samson was born specifically to fight off the Philistines because they were harassing the Danites, the tribe of Dan. Esther was born specifically for such a time as to save Israelites from Amen. Are you starting to see these things? John the Baptist was born specifically 
to be the forerunner of Jesus. We are all born. God has a plan for you and for me. For me. And in each generation, God has a plan. God does not play favoritism. God does not do nepotism. He does not appoint his fellow tribes people into, eh, into power. He uses people who devote themselves to him. When we study scripture, we see in scripture that the people God used, starting from Abraham, that he chose them because of their heart. He chose them because of their heart. And when you look at Abraham, Joseph, why did God choose Jacob instead of Esau? Why did he choose David out of all his handsome brothers and not him? Why did God choose Samuel instead of the children of Eli? Why did God choose? Why did God choose? Why did God choose Obadiah? If you study the Old Testament, Obadiah was an Edomite who became a Christian, or oh well, a Jew, and moved to Jerusalem and had favor with Ahab and Jezebel for crying out loud. But he was a faithful man to the point that he took, when Jezebel was killing prophets, he took thousands of them and hid them in a cave. That was Obadiah. The same Obadiah that wrote the book of Obadiah in the Bible. He wasn't even a Jew originally. He was somebody who has the heart of God. Same thing with Hosea. Go read this thing. God does not favor anybody. He looks at the heart and he looks at, is this person ready to be used? In scripture, we find some attributes about the people God has used. Some similarities in saying from Abraham to the apostles to even contemporary people, some attributes in their lives. The first one we see is that they are very sinful people. Every person God used has a sin nature and they sin. And we all know they are sin. From adultery to murder to whatever you want to call it. But the, the thing we also see, thank you sir. The thing we also see in their life is that they are very quick to repent. If you look at the life of people that God used, when God corrects them, they are very quick to say, my bad, <laughs> I'm sorry. Very quick to say I'm sorry. The second thing we see in their lives, everyone that God used, God's man, is they have the fear of God. They have the fear of God. Now, in the Greek, there are two Greek words for fear. One is phobia or phobic. The other one is timao, T-I-M-A-O. Phobic is intimidation, fear by intimidation. And timao is fear based on reverence. I love this person. I reverence this person because of what they have done in their life because of how God has used them and because of how they have revered their life. That is the fear of God. The fear, that is why Solomon said the fear of God that leads to wisdom. The fear that leads to wisdom, that is the Timao fear. The third thing we found about these people is that these are people who are obedient to God and they trust God with their lives. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Each one of these people that God used in the Bible, even when it comes to their life, they want to die. Rather than not obey God, they would rather die. Daniel told the people, he said, I will not eat this fruit because you have made it to idol. I would rather die. I would rather die. Same Daniel, another king. 
This was the one about the food was with a Babylonian king. Then this time with a Medo Persian king, a couple of decades later, he said, Don't pray. He prayed and he said, We will throw you into the lions. Then he said, No, the God said we shouldn't do that. I would rather go into the lions then than, than stop praying. Same thing. Same thing with Paul. with Paul. If you study the book of Acts, you will see that Paul, God told him he was going to suffer in, Jerusalem, in Rome. God told him. When he was in Ephesus, returning back to Jerusalem, God said to him in a dream, he said, you're going to testify for me in Rome, but you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. Be ready for that. And he got to Jerusalem, the people, the crazy people from Ephesus were already waiting for him, and he spent almost two years in jail in, 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 in Jerusalem. First, uh, Felix was looking for a bribe from him before they shipped him to Rome. You see the same thing. They want to obey God. They obey God even at the cost to their life, but they trust God. I told the first service, I said, my faith verse, my faith verse is Daniel 3, 16 to 18. When somebody asks me about faith, what's your view on faith? I refer them to Daniel 3, 16 to 18. That is where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Nebuchadnezzar made the image and said everybody should bow, and they said they're not going to bow, and then they told the king, oh king, may you live forever. That's how they greet them in those days. We know our God. We know he is powerful and able to save us. That is not the question. We know he is powerful. We know his power. We've read about it. We've seen it. But we have decided that even if he chooses that today is the day we die, in your fiery furnace, we will still not bow. Is, is somebody understanding this? The key is knowing what does God really want. Then the other thing we see that is common to these people is that they yield to God. What Paul describes in Galatians 2.20. For now I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer Femi that lives, but Christ that lives in Femi. The life Femi lives now is not my life, it's the life of Christ in Femi. So when Ola, that's my wife, does something that Femi does not like, instead of Femi replying the way Femi should react as an African boy, how, does Femi, how should Femi react? The Christ in Femi. Praise the Lord, oh single, single. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Instead of speaking French, I'll bless you. That is how the Christ in Femi reacts. They yield their will. Not my will, but your will. And then we see that the last thing, last point I'm going to give you, is that they understand, they learn from the journey God is taking them through. As prime minister, after Joseph exposed himself to his brother, that he was their brother, remember when his brother were afraid what he, afraid what he told them? He said, what you meant for evil, God turned it for good. If you didn't sell me, I would not be the prime minister of Egypt. I will not be the prime minister of Egypt. I joked yesterday, I'm a young man from Alagomeji in Lagos. I was born and raised in Alagomeji. We were poor. Okay, we didn't have a lot of stuff. Today, as I speak to you, by God's grace, and I'm saying this to the glory of God, to the glory of God, I have spoken in over 50 countries, I have written 14 books. A lot of my books are in languages I don't even know. And God is just doing amazing things. And what I tell people is, if God can take me 
from walking to school without a shoe for some time and use me in that capacity. I'm not, I'm not even saying that is even anything. Just please understand me. I'm just telling you in my own life, Femi's life. If God can do that, he can do anything. And that's what I tell all these young people I meet all over the world. You just be faithful in what he has called you to do. Be faithful. So those are the things we see, attributes that we see. And then generation. There has been many generations. There are many generations. The generation of Abraham. The generation of his children. The generation of Israel having kings. The generation of kings destroying Israel. The generation of the Assyrians. I mean, if you understand history, you will understand what I'm talking about. And in each generation, God uses an ordinary person. But he's looking for that ordinary person that has the attributes that we just talked about. Each generation, he's looking for somebody to use. He's looking for person, somebody to use in our generation. It's not exhaustive. It's not just only Billy Graham or Adeboye that God wants to use. He wants to use you in your own lane for what he has proposed for you to do before the beginning of time. The question is, are you going to surrender to be used by him? Are you going to surrender to be used by him? In the days of the powerful king, I just talked about Obadiah, an Edomite who came to Jerusalem. God used him to save thousands of priests from the hand of Jezebel. God used Saul, a killer, to be the one that he will use to speak to the Gentiles. God is no respecter of person. God uses when you are available, when you make yourself available, when you are quick to say, God, I am sorry, when you have the fear of God, he will use you. I promise you that. In the, in the, in the, in the early service, I told the story of the Maccabees. Some of you have heard of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabees. Okay. It's, a, it's a story in the intertestament time of the Bible. The Greek era, when the Greek were the most powerful people. Alexander the Great, wonderful young man. Read his story, amazing story. 13-year-old, his father sent him to live with Socrates. Came back as a 16-year-old. His father was the king of Macedonia. Came back, his father died, became king of Macedonia by age 21. By age 31, he had conquered the whole world. Conquered the whole world. When he died as a 31-year-old, because of alcohol, by the way, when he died as a 31-year-old, his generals cannot keep all the territory that he kept. By the way, let me tell you something about Alexandra. Modern warfare, modern warfare, they are still using strategy. his strategy. Today, the battalion, uh, all those things, was Alexandra the Great that came up with it. His kingdom was broken down into two. Four, actually. It eventually became two. And the king that ruled the region that was over Israel was the Seleucids. And a couple of generations later, one crazy Seleucid general named Antiochus IV, hated Jews, decided to persecute Jews brought pigs and killed in the temple. If you want to off offend Jews, that's what you do. He was doing that all over Jerusalem, all over the territory, until he came to a small village, Molin or something like that. And this young, or, well, old man, priest, decided, I'm not going to stand for that. And he resisted the army of the Greeks. By the way, not because of fight, but because of divine intervention. I noticed that that was your, that's your theme for this month. If you read the story of how the Maccabees de defeated the army of Greece, it was because 
when they want to send the army, another army will come up and then they will go and fight it there. They won't come. By the time they are ready to come, it's already winter. They can't come. Talk about divine <laughs> intervention. Because if they came in their strength, they would defeat them quick. This is what happened, and God used this family, and God raised up this family. Eventually, they became what is called known as the Asmonean dynasty. God is no respecter of person. For you to function in the generation that God has called you, you have to understand what is going on in my generation and what does God want me to do. What is going on? What generation am I in? We call it the 21st century. What does it mean? How does it line up with God's word? For me, two words came to mind or come to mind when we're thinking of the generation we live in. The first thing is postmodernism. Postmodernism. Many of you have heard of the word postmodernism. Basically, what postmodernism means is this we are no longer influenced by religion. We are now modern. We have modern things, technology, modern days, modern that. We don't need God. You can live in this country without having faith. Oh, yeah. All you need is your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> it's only when you max out your credit card that you realize, oh Jesus. But the people in Nepal, they don't have credit card. They call Jesus from day one. On a trip to Nepal a couple of years ago, this village is very far. You land in Kathmandu, you take one flight, you drive one hour, you on the bike one hour. I went to preach at this church, small church. The whole church is like this segment. And everybody sit on the floor. Yes, they, sit, they still sit on the floor. So after service, this woman came up to me and brought the husband. And the hand was, they are all farmers. I think he hit it with a hoe or something and gangrene or something as... Come on it. You know, you can tell that this hand. Ooh. So they brought the wife with the interpreter. My friend came and said, they were talking whatever language they were talking. And my friend said, the wife wants you to pray. Those of you who know me, you know I'm not a preacher like that. I'm a teacher. My own job is just to teach. Uh -huh. So I run away from when people say, uh -huh, pray like that. And she said, pray. I said, and in my head, I'm thinking, ooh, we need antibiotic. <laughs> that was the first thing that came to my mind. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you don't need antibiotic. Pray. And I prayed, and that is the only time, the first and the only time in my life that I have seen a miracle. First and only time in my life that I am part of it, that I saw a hand become normal. I have had stories, but that me, I am part of it. It has not happened again. I don't know why. Maybe I need to go back to Nepal. <laughs> what generation are you living in? Postmodernism. Postmodernism basically is what I feel and what I think. And then another word is secular humanism. Secular humanism basically says, Eh, we don't really need God as long as you do good. Now, in this generation, goodness supersedes godliness. Uh, there are thousands of worldviews, but five worldviews are dominant in the world today. Five. Atheism. All of you know atheism. Deism. Okay, you know deism? Okay, these are people who think there is a God somewhere, but it doesn't get involved in our business anymore. Third one is pantheism. Pantheism are religions like Hinduism, Shintoism, Buddhism that says you can become God. You just have to practice. In, in Buddhism, you follow Nirvana, eight steps. 
In Hinduism, you follow a path, you do meditation, you connect with God, and then you get a title of God. Dalai, Guru, Maharaji, that's Hinduism. So, but they all fall under pan-theism. Then polytheism. Polytheism are religions in Africa. That is what we do. We practice many gods, many paths to God. The Greeks, they are polytheist. Zeus, Achilles, uh, Venus, all these things. And then monotheism. Monotheism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And even under that, there are so many different breakdowns. The reason I'm sharing this with you is that many of us don't even realize how some pantheistic tendencies have come into the church and we don't even know what it is. And we're practicing it. The I am God concept is from polytheism. Positive thinking is from polytheism. You don't have to believe me. Just go study the Nirvana. I have. And so, but what has happened is they have cornered us Christians into a corner that our job is to do good. Doing good is fantastic. But that's not, that's our secondary job. Our secondary job is to preach. Go ye into the world Teach and make disciples. When you are making disciples, feed them. That's what Jesus did. Take care of their need. Because if you don't, then you are not a true Christian. But first of all, you preach. Is somebody seeing what I'm trying to say? That is, you understand what is it in my generation. Now, what does a godly man do? He understands that God is looking for somebody to use in every generation. He understands that he has a purpose. He understands that God is, doesn't have favorite. You just have to align yourself with him and he will use you regardless of your background. Does not matter. He understands that and he says, God, I am here, use me. And that starts with salvation. Confession of faith and letting God be the Lord of your life. And letting his spirit, his Holy Spirit, guide you. When you do that, then you start to say, God, where do you want me? You align yourself, your relationship with God is priority. Daddies and even mommies, your children learn more from your non-verbal than your verbal commands. They learn more from your non-verbal than your verbal commands. When your life reflects, when your children can say to people outside, oh, my daddy is the same inside at home and same thing outside. He's not Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. At home, he's a crazy, lousy, whatever, but at church, <laughs> he's a, he's a dickin. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. No, your children will hate church if you are Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. But if you are the same at home and you are the same in church, that's, that's, that's what will bring your children. And you can only do that when you have relationship with God. Number two, when you prioritize your family. Your wife before your children. Your children will leave you one day. If they don't leave you, you will pray that they go. <laughs> and then it's just going to be the two of you till death comes. And then you enjoy life. You enjoy life. You prioritize, then ministry comes in. I just want to share that one of the purposes of God in our life is to raise for him godly children is the marriage institution or family institution and god is at the enemy is attacking that like no man's business during the inter service pastor and i were talking about some of these things even our children that we raised in church it's tough for them 
It is tough for them because they live in a larger society that is telling them this, and we are telling them this, and they are confused. So what is it? Is it God? And then our own children think we are judgmental. I ain't judgmental. I just believe the Bible. If you got to believe the Bible, then you got to believe the whole Bible. You have to understand God's purpose for you as a father, for you as a husband. What is God's purpose? There are three things I find in scripture. God's purpose when it comes to marriage. Number one, companionship. Number two, to raise godly children. And number three, to be an example of Christ and church. And each person will have to determine what is it that you are going to do this strategy in your own home. The strategy that pastor used is probably different from the strategy in my house. But it is the same thing. I got a call on Friday before coming here. Somebody, I went to a church in Arkansas to speak, and this person called me out of the blue and said, many years ago you said that your children, when you were raising them, you recommended a book. I said, I always recommend a book. I know exactly the book you are talking about. He said, so how do you do it? I said, well, here is what the book recommends. It's a book by scientists, but it says between zero and two, this is what children need, what they need uh, academically, physiologically, spiritually. Five to eight, this is what they need. Nine to 11, this is what they need. And spiritually, emotionally, and everything like that. My daughter is adopted. She's 20 years old now. She was born into a cocaine, by, to a cocaine mother. They took her the day she was born. And because of how she was raised, not only did she have cocaine thing, she also has something called RAD. The medical people here will know it. Reactive attention disorder. And that is a disease that, at least till today, they don't have a cure for. It's an emotional disorder. Each stage of development in your children's life is extremely crucial. Your role as dad is extremely crucial. You have to be there for them. If as much as possible. It's not just money. I have a friend who just thinks as long as he takes his children to Disney, that that is cool. No, Disney is cool, but taking them to Bible study is also cool. Amen. Doing Bible study, like the children told us, is also cool. Disney is cool, don't get me wrong. But what is cool, I told this young man, I said my children went to something called Bible study fellowship for seven years. Both of them. So Bible to them is not David and Goliath. That Bible to them is deep study. It's uh, 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 humanetics. We did Bible quiz. I saw that your church you have Bible quiz. 99% of kids who do Bible quiz end up staying in the faith. In case you don't know that. Memorize scripture. This is our role. And when we do this, we raise the next generation that will glorify God. We are God's people for his generation. Your background does not stop him from using you. I promise you that. Your background does not disqualify you. What disqualifies you is are you willing? God has chosen so many who, did, who were not willing. Saul. So, he wasn't. God chose him, but he wasn't. There's so many. Samson, God chose him. He went in a different direction. Are you going to stay with God? God has put you in a family that that can happen here in House on the Rock. God has given you resources that that can happen. Are you going to do it? More than that, you have the Holy Spirit of God. God, this morning, we thank you for this celebration time. We thank you 
for celebrating men and fathers who will raise the next generation. Not only by being example, by being a good dad to their wives, in spite of everything, but a good dad to their children and a, somebody that can be looked up to in the community. Not in their strength, but in your word and leaning on the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you continue to use us on the rock as example of a family church. Lord, I pray for men in this assembly that they will grow, they will renew their commitment to you to say, we will raise the next generation for God's glory. Lord, we pray for our children. Solomon said, when you train your child in the way he or she should go, when they, when they become adults, after they've gone here and there and there, he said they will come back. He said that is a promise of God. They will come back. So Lord, the children that we have raised in House on the Rock, that right now, we don't know. We don't know. They are telling us all these uh, humanist mumbo-jumbo that they learned from their professors. Lord, I pray that because of the seed that was sown in them, Lord, they will come back home. Lord, they will be useful for their generation. Lord, they will stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their generation. Lord, they will stand with boldness like Paul in his generation. Lord, they will stand boldly like Jonathan, the pastor. They will boldly proclaim Christ like Billy Graham. Lord, I pray that in our lives, in our homes, in your church, your name will be glorified. Thank you, Father, for we prayed in Jesus' name.